Greetings, everyone. My name is Emily Louie, and on behalf of Campbell & Company, I would like to welcome you to Arts and Culture in COVID-19, sharing challenges, successes, and advice. We want to thank you all for joining us today and hope we can provide some relief during this difficult time. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly go through some logistics for those of you who may be new to our webinars. First, please close any programs other than GoToWebinar that are running on your computer. Next, we recommend calling in with the telephone instead of using your computer speakers. And if you do experience any visual issues, please send us a chat or contact GoToWebinar at the number on your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and will last 60 minutes. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes information on how to access the recording. We do welcome questions throughout the webinar, so please use the questions box and the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the right side of your computer screen. We will also be holding time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our presenters today, Vice President Melissa Berliner, Senior Consultant Cassie Carter, and Consultant Kelsey Nelson. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Berliner. I'm a Vice President with the firm in our Chicago office. I've been in my role for 13 years, and prior I served in various fundraising roles with arts organizations here in Chicago. I'm honored and delighted to continue that work in my current role as a leader of our arts and culture practice, working with so many of you around the country. And also just wanted to congratulate you for making it through another week. Uh, it's Friday, so kudos to you. We did it, onward and upward. Thanks, Melissa. I'm Cassie Carter, and I am on the West team for Campbell & Company. I have been a senior consultant with the firm uh, going on my fifth year now, and I've been working in primarily arts and culture institutions for my entire career. I uh, My first job out of college was with the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County on the program side, helping build an insect zoo. And I've been working um, on both the program side and on the fundraising side um, in various organizations, mostly arts and culture, for the last uh, 25 years. And very pleased uh, to have you join us today and start to share and build more community. Great, thank you, Kathy. I'm Kelsey Nelson. I'm a consultant out of our Chicago office, and I've been with Campbell and Company for three and a half years. My academic background is in the visual arts, and I started my fundraising career in the museum world. And throughout my time at Campbell, I've had the great pleasure of extending my experience in the arts and culture sector through work with theaters, ballets, symphony orchestras, and zoos and aquaria. Um, so in listening to our introductions, you've probably picked up on the fact that Melissa, Cassie, and I are true believers in the power of art to inspire individuals and unite communities. And we want to thank you for everything you're doing to keep your organizations afloat. And we hope that in addition to giving you um, a, a little more feeling of solidarity with your peers, this conversation will provide you with tactical advice to guide you through your decision making and donor interactions in the coming weeks. Um, so to that end, I'll run through our agenda quickly. We're going to begin by sharing some of the things our firm has learned about fundraising in challenging times throughout our 44 year history. Then we'll talk about some of the themes that are arising in conversations with our arts and culture clients, as well as suggested strategies for overcoming challenges. And we're going to try to get through all of that fairly quickly so we can devote a large chunk of our time today to audience Q&A. And with that, I'll pass to Melissa to get us started. Thanks, Kelsey. And while we don't have a crystal ball to tell us what we will look like on the other side of this, we can glean some learnings from other challenging times that might help us navigate today and our near future. So first of all, we know from the recession that donors will not stop giving, but they will narrow the number of organizations they give to, generally focusing on their top two or three top charitable causes. And we know in our arts and culture sector in particular, we took a hit following the recession and we assume or presume that some giving was reallocated or designated to support human need or basic human services. But I also know from working with so many of you during that time that you were able to climb back from pre-recession, climb back to pre-recession giving levels and even surpass that relatively quickly. So we are strong as a sector and our donors 
want to give and want to stay with us and want to come back to us, even if they, even if they pivot for a moment. We also know that donors will take longer to make decisions about significant gifts, especially those backed by accumulated wealth in the markets. And I should say we know that this is true for some donors, but not all. So the, the best practice, major gift fundraising, case by case factor is alive and well right now. So we need to look at each donor individually and decide based on our relationship, based on our knowledge, uh, what, what might be right given that donor circumstance. And for some, it is about a longer lead time to make decisions, but for others, it's not. We know that there are some people out there right now who are making transformative gifts in support of the arts. We know of a board member on the East Coast who stepped forward with a million dollar challenge grant for a theater company. I actually got a call yesterday from a board chair asking me how a $250,000 gift right now could be leveraged to inspire his peers to, to join him in, in supporting an arts organization. So we know donors may take longer to make decisions, but we also know it's case by case. We also learned from the recession that almost all, or 95% of the campaigns Campbell and Company was working in met or exceeded their goals. And for those organizations that found success during that time, many of them did have to extend their timeline, so by six or 12 months. For those that did not find success, that small percentage, I would say that the reason was not because of the recession. There was some sort of internal factor, a leadership transition, another fundraising situation or crisis that took time and attention away from the campaign. And that's what led to a miss on the goal. But the good news is, is that most of our campaigns, 95% met their goals during that challenging time. And the last learning that we can look to uh, as a guidepost is that organizations that stay in close touch with their donors, especially those mid and major level donors, will fare much better than those that do not. And this ties back up to the first point on the slide. Something I'm telling our clients every day is what are you doing today to think about donor retention? As you think about your to-do list, and they are long, I know we have long to-do lists today. I feel it with you. Uh, but if you can prioritize those activities that are solely focused on donor retention and maybe back burner some of those other activities that you might be engaged in in, the, in this time, you will fare better on the other side. So keep those donors close. And a few, a few minutes on key challenges and what we're hearing from the field. We don't want to dwell on this because we know you're living this in real time. What we want to do is let you know that you're not alone, that you are, are sharing in this with your peers around the country. Uh, and this is what we've heard from you or what we're seeing uh, as we look around. So certainly closures are significantly impacting revenue streams, and yet your expenses stay the same. So you don't have the dollars coming in. Uh, your earned revenue streams, but your, your expenses are not going down. And with that, leaders are having to make very hard decisions. We're definitely seeing some furloughs, layoffs, pay cuts. And a larger theme uh, connected to these points is that we're noticing in this moment that uh, our arts and culture boards may not be as in the know on the business of art making, play making, museum making, insert your craft there, but boards of directors are not as close to the business of what we do. And for some of our organizations, they're having a hard time advising uh, their leaders on how to navigate uh, through this. That being said, we are seeing some of you out there doing a great job bringing your board members even closer, uh, forming task forces, bringing them in under the hood to, to really learn the business of what you do. And on the other side of this, you will emerge as a stronger board or you will emerge with a stronger board and a, having a stronger relationship with those board members, which would be a great, a great win on the other side. We also realize that the path forward for many events is uncertain. We're seeing so many of you pivot in really creative and interesting ways and even raise the dollars that you need to be raising through virtual events or online events or non-events, just asking sponsors to, to give money without actually attending an event. 
And I would say here, this could be another opportunity, just like the point about the board above, uh, you know, so many of you struggle with your events and think about whether or not it's time to stop doing an event or consider doing something else. And perhaps this is a time to create a fresh slate and think about uh, how you might shift your focus or your time or your energy away from events in order to take on something that might create greater return. And then finally, donor messaging has become difficult for so many of you to navigate in this crisis. And I've talked a lot with some of you and my colleagues at Campbell about this perceived hierarchy of need right now and how arts and culture organizations are struggling with fitting into that uh, when there is a lot of human suffering around the world. So how do we ask our donors to give to us instead of or alongside something that might be perceived as more urgent? And to that, I would say, don't uh, don't opt into that hierarchy of need. It's, you're not going to win, and it's it's not going to be an effective way for you to communicate your your need or your urgency right now. Instead, find success in thinking about how donors connect with you authentically, which is that emotional connection that draws them to you in the first place. We feel your closure right now. We feel that as a loss. Believe me, I would love nothing more than to take my seven-year-old to a museum or some other uh, organization, arts organization right now. Um, so we feel your loss um, immeasurably. So c connect with that message. Connect with that emotional uh, place that we are all in with you and that really serves as the foundation of our relationship with you. And we'll talk a little bit more about messaging in a few minutes. So to follow up on what Melissa was sharing, the encouraging news or the, the, the silver lining of what she was describing is that donors are responding to the outreach that we're seeing coming from organizations. Um, and if you are re reaching out to your donors in an authentic way and you are sharing the impact on your organization, but also more to the point, what are you doing in a positive way to be enriching their lives? That, that um, absence in arts and culture, that presence is so sorely missed to emphasize what Melissa was saying. So what we're finding out is that the organizations that are reaching out with very brief, very clear, very concise, very authentic messaging are seeing a response from their donors. And the organizations that are um, doing this outreach in a way that brings your donors closer, they get it to see behind the scenes, they get to know you better, this is an opportunity to actually be connecting with your donors at a deeper level. Um, you have their attention in a very unique and unprecedented way. The other thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of grace in this period of time. Your messaging does not need to be polished. It does not need to be perfect. It can be um, cell phone video. One of the one of the things that my family has started watching almost every afternoon is from a, a sea turtle rehab center in Florida that shares stories of the turtles, and they do a live feed for about 20 minutes every afternoon. It's raw. It's unscripted. It's really engaging, and we greatly appreciate that connection. And so we have formed a deeper connection with this with this organization that's actually across the country from, from where I'm living now. Um, you do want to ask for very focused and specific support in your messaging. So this is the time to be thinking about what is it that you really need to be able to stay and thrive. Um, and, and again, an unprecedented opportunity to be asking for core operating support. Uh, most of the time, we would be recommending that you're focused at a higher level in terms of so focus on your programs and the impact that you might have. But right now, you actually have an opportunity to, to do some different messaging. Um, the other thing that we are finding as we, as we look at what opportunities are, uh, the organizations have is that major donors do want to know how you're doing. And we've seen some really wonderful success in just the human to human outreach where fundraisers are calling major donors asking how they're doing, um, connecting with them on a human level, and then going back and saying, here's where we are right now as an organization, here's where we're having success, here's where we're struggling, um, and then if the conversation goes there, you know, how, how can you help? To a point that Melissa made early on, some donors 
uh, still have the ability to make gifts, and we are seeing some some really wonderful, significant major gifts coming in. I'm working with um, an aquarium right now that has seen some significant major gifts from donors that were not major gift donors to them prior to this, but just through that human-to-human -human contact, people are responding. Another opportunity right now are donor-advised funds, and we would encourage you for any of your donors that give through donor-advised funds to be reaching out to them and talking to them specifically about considering an additional gift this year. The wonderful thing about a donor-advised fund is that money has already been been placed. They've already received the tax write-off for it, and it's, it's available, and a lot of donors tend to um, hold on to their donor advice funds, and so now is the time to have those, those authentic and open conversations with them. Um, the other thing to be thinking about is if you're in campaign, what do you do? And this is a really important conversation. Um, one museum that I'm working with right now has had several of their major donors step up and say to them, I've made a pledge, I've made a five-year pledge to your campaign. Um, how about if I make it a six-year pledge and this year's pledge goes to your core operating and then the five go to the, go to your uh, campaign goals if you intend to continue. And they do intend to continue and we encourage you to continue with your campaign work, but to be looking at an extended timeline and perhaps repurposing some of the, some of the funds. Um, I've also seen some foundations step forward and offer to repurpose their funding. And so if they're giving you funds right now for programs, this is an opportunity to be um, talking to them about core operating and repurposing and then perhaps um, returning back to the program funding once we get through this. The other thing that I've seen, which is really remarkable, are foundations that, that don't ordinarily provide program or core operating funds to some organizations offering to, to move forward and provide some of this support. One foundation that I'm working with, um, who usually takes about three to six months to make decisions on funding. They put out um, a call for proposals. The proposals were just a paragraph for organizations that um, are in need right now. They made a decision within five to seven days, and then they were actually providing funding uh, within 10 days. I mean, that's remarkable. So foundations right now are in this really wonderful and unique position of being able to respond quickly. and we. Um, and we're seeing some organizations really leverage their deep relationships. If you have foundation funding, now's the time to reach out and talk to the foundation. Uh, one question that we hear quite a bit from our clients is, how much of the behind the scenes do we really show those foundations? Right now, you have, again, this unique opportunity to be authentic and to share with them, where do you feel resilient and where do you need help? and foundations understand it in a, in a truly unprecedented way. Um, when it comes to the content that you're sharing with your donors, a peek behind the scenes has been really wonderful and really fun. I think most of you have probably seen the um, Shed Aquarium penguins running around the aquarium and looking at the, the fish in the tanks. I've seen a lot of truly wonderful raw programming going on right now as a, as a peek behind the scenes. I'm a museum curator walking through the uh, exhibits and sharing where they, uh, w what the origin of some of their artifacts are. Um, I heard from a colleague yesterday that um, a, a zoo that was doing some rehab has been filming the releases back into the wild of some of the, or some of the animals that they rehab. They, they filmed a, a weasel going back into the wild. They had about 5,000 people join their, their little short footage on that when they did it live. So then they thought, well, this is really sort of fun and people are enjoying it. So then they filmed some more things that were behind the scenes that were raw. And one of their um, their sort of impromptu webinars had 100,000 people join it. And these are new people. This is, this is just an amazing and unprecedented time to get the attention of potential donors um, in a way where you're providing a resource to them, but they then hopefully will be able to provide a resource back to you. Um, some strategies. I'd like to talk about strategies that we're seeing from the from the organizations that are being successful. Um, this is a gift of time, and I know that that's a hard thing to soak in. I know that's a hard thing to feel right now because I don't know how all, all of you are feeling, but I feel like my time is even less, even though I'm trapped at home by and large. 
Um, but it really is truly a gift of time to do the things that you can do behind the scenes that you may not normally feel like you have the opportunity to do. Uh, database cleanup. I've been working with several arts and culture organizations right now around um, doing that coding of the donors that they've really wanted to do and reformatting how they're putting together their reports and doing some of that, that heavy behind the scenes lift that you can do remotely and you can do um, in partnership perhaps with, with a consulting partner. I'm also seeing organizations take a look at their policies and their procedures. Do they need to be updated right now um, with the crisis that we're in? Are they current? Are they where they need them to be? Now is an opportunity you have your board attention that you ordinarily wouldn't have to be thinking about those policies and procedures. And then um, in a slightly more somber uh, consideration, you want to make sure that everything that you do that's essential at your organization is documented and that you are doing cross-training with your staff. So that way then, as people have different levels of availability, you can make sure that you're continuing with those core and important and essential functions. And um, if you do have team members that have a family member who's ill or they become ill, you wanna make sure that you can continue that process. So documenting and creating very simple work plans right now with your team, I think is important. Um, Another opportunity you have is to really hone your messaging for donor engagement. What is the relevance that you as an organization brings to the community? How do you express it in simple, clear, um, fun, concise ways? And not, not being um, tone deaf to what's going on, but helping share the sense that we are in a community together and that it's important for us to uh, build and strengthen that community. Now is also a time to be doing some of that portfolio research. Um, who's in your portfolio? Um, what do you know about them? What's a good strategy? Who do you start to connect with and reach out to directly? We're seeing a lot of really wonderful strengthening of donor relationships right now. Shockingly and surprisingly, your donors are at home and they're answering their phone and they're answering emails and they're reading what you're sending out. So now is definitely a time to leverage that. Now is also a time to leverage your leadership. Your board members who have been super busy and unavailable now have the time to actually do some of those outreach phone calls and you have time to uh, strategize with them. Um, and then again, working with your board and your volunteers on your core and key messaging. Anything that you can do via Zoom that's remote, that's keep, keeping people together, building community, reinforcing your mission and why you exist, this is actually, again, I will emphasize, this is a gift of time. And a really, um, if we find the silver lining, there's a lot that we can be doing right now. Um, and it's important for us to be maintaining those connections. So now I'll pass on to Kelsey to share some more strategies. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. Um, so just a few more strategies here. First, if you haven't already, do a deep dive into the CARES Act. Don't read all a thousand pages. Um, <laughs> just find one of the really good resources that are out there. There's lots of um, blogs and, and links. Um, we have one on our website. Um, there are several provisions that could affect your organization from loans to cover payroll, expenses and debt service, to deferred tax payments, to tax incentives for donors. Um, hopefully those of you eligible for payroll protection plan loans have already been in touch with your bank. We'd encourage everyone to keep talking to their financial institutions, even if you find you're not able to apply for or don't receive a loan through the first round of funding, um, as politicians and advocates are already discussing another rescue package. And we know there's a lot of uncertainty. It's a, it's a messy process right now, um, but be in touch with your financial institutions. And if they can't help you, be in touch with your board members who likely have connections to other institutions. To speak very briefly to some of the other implications of the bill for donors, it includes a one-year charitable deduction of up to $300 for non-itemizers who make cash gifts to eligible charities. So folks who take the standard deduction can claim this credit on their 2020 returns. This could be something to consider working into your annual giving appeals, particularly later in the year. And my initial thought when I read about this was that's exactly the type of thing you wanna include in the PS of a direct mail solicitation. Also, for the small percentage of individuals who do itemize, this year they're not limited to deducting 60% of their adjusted gross income. They can deduct up to 100%. 
And the cap on deductions for corporations has also been lifted from 10 to 25%. So these provisions are probably only going to affect your highest capacity donors. But again, it's, it's good to just read a little more about this and have a handle on the law so you can reference them as needed in gift conversations. To switch gears a bit, focus on making the creative content your organization produces available to your current patrons and broader audiences. So Kathy spoke a lot about this. And I just want to reinforce the, the fact that this is an anxiety-filled time, and art is a wonderful outlet for that anxiety. It's worth the effort to make creative content you're producing available digitally. This will build goodwill within your family and could help spread awareness of your mission and programs beyond that. Um, and it's not only a good way to leverage the love the public has for you, it's also an opportunity to develop infrastructure that could be preserved and built upon well after we emerge from our stay-at-home order. Don't scrap any plans, communications, or solicitations, um, except perhaps for acquisition pieces. Instead, tweak the messaging and, if needed, the medium. Um, so you want to think about keeping all of your communication short and clear and focused on that human-to-human -human connection, continuing to promote your mission, but being aware of the place your organization has in the community at this moment in time. So, you know, Melissa spoke a little bit about this, about not playing the hierarchy of needs game. And I think another way to put this is you wanna make sure that you're striking a balance between alarmism and what, I love this, what our director of communication calls now more than everism. Um, so don't just say the same thing you were going to and add now more than ever, uh, but neither should you adopt an overly alarmist tone. In other words, instead of saying, we make great art, which is more important than ever, or we had to cancel our season and our future is in peril, you might think about saying something like, here are the ways we are bringing art to you to help you get through these tough times. We hope you'll let us into your home and consider supporting us, so we'll be here to bring you joy in good times and bad for years to come. Consider whether there were strategic adjustments your organization has been thinking about for which the time is now right. So, uh, you know, to go back to what Melissa was saying about um, events and, and taking a good hard look at your strategy there and also to tie into what Kathy was saying about, you know, there probably being more time and, and bandwidth. Um, just think about what these things are. Maybe it's, you know, whether to move your gala to an every other year schedule. Um, maybe you are looking into investing in better technology to capture online donations. Um, or maybe there are small shifts in staff roles and responsibilities you had been mulling over. So there's a junior person on your team who you think is ready to step up and manage a small portfolio. Now's the time. Give them some mid-level donors to start reaching out to. Of course, um, as, as Kathy was alluding to with leadership, keep your loyal donors close and your board even closer. Communicate regularly, I would say once a week if, if possible to at least the board, um, to let them know how the pandemic is affecting you, how you're responding and, and what they can do to help. Um, some of these messages will be important updates about your responses and needs, but they don't all have to be. I've seen some great examples from arts organizations of short videos their CEO is filming in their home office to say hello and share positive news about an ongoing program and then sending out by email. Um, I've also seen organizations who are sharing internal updates from leadership and colleagues via blog posts and social media. This could be anything from a collaborative playlist to pictures and videos of artistic and education staff continuing to do their jobs at home. Think about using all of your staff to make care calls to donors. Uh, Melissa was telling me and Kathy about one of her clients who's been having their artistic staff call donors right now. I love this. I, I mean, we all know fundraisers are great, but wouldn't you want to get a call from a dancer or an actor or a musician you've seen on stage? Um, so think about that. And, and then also for you frontline fundraisers who are wondering what the message should be to your major donors right now, our advice is to use this time for qualification. You might add one or two discovery questions to your check-in phone calls. And for those donors who are already qualified and in cultivation for a gift, you're probably going to need to re-qualify them. You'll gather a lot of information about how they're feeling the impact of COVID-19 just by asking how they're doing. And, and again, just to reiterate, Kathy said this, it's okay if you're not as buttoned up as you want to be um, when you make these calls or, or when you make any type of donor outreach. There's a lot of permission for not having the answers right now, just be kind and empathetic. And finally, don't stop your campaign, multi-year or annual. You're probably going to need to adjust timelines. For those of you in a capital or comprehensive campaign, you might need to be flexible for donors who need more time to pay off their pledges or make their gift decision. 
But the fact is your funding needs have not gone away. If you halt your conversations now, it's going to be really difficult to resume them. The message, of course, is going to have to be adjusted, but chances are there's a way to connect your strategic priorities that you were raising money for in the first place to needs that are even more apparent during the pandemic. And I think I'll go back to Emily now for Q&A. Great, thank you all so much. We'll be, uh, we will now be taking audience questions, so please send those through uh, the questions box and the GoToWebinar control panel. We also invite you to share your experiences and how your organization has been responding to COVID-19. So let's get started. Kelsey, this question is for you. Would you recommend scrapping a lapsed mailing as well? And would you recommend reducing an acquisition mailing or eliminating a mailed piece entirely and moving it online? That's, that's a great question. Um, first, let me say, I don't think there's a right answer. I, I think there are several strategies um, that can be used here. I was talking with one organization a, a couple weeks ago, earlier on in, in this whole process, and they were planning on an acquisition only mailing uh, that was supposed to be dropping in mid-March um, and had already written it. You know, it was at the mail house that was ready to drop. And we talked about, you know, what do you do? Is, is this the right time or not? And um, this was a social services organization doing uh, youth development work. And, you know, we talked about it and, and I said, you know, what if you put an insert in? What if you quickly designed a little buck slip um, that would mean you didn't have to lose all the money and, and redo the mailing or pull the mailing, but it says, you know, we, as we were preparing to send this mailing, you know, the situation evolved, here's the ways in which we're responding, here's why we think our work is, is more important than ever in the communities um, that, you know, we're invested in and, and what we're doing to continue. And, you know, we hope you'll, um, you'll keep this in mind as you read about our organization. Um, so I think there's a, there's a way to do that with your lapsed donors. I, I would keep the mailing and, and change the message, I think. Um, those people are still in your universe and they gave to you at one point in time and now might be the right time when they're looking for something um, to do that that's constructive. I think um, we can't presume to know which of our donors want to give right now and are just waiting for that mechanism. Um, and then thinking about going digitally, I, I do think, you know, there, there are some concerns with direct mail right now, people opening mail, but also obviously warehouses and, and what it means for um, people uh, working to produce direct mail. So that that has to be just a the staff decision. I think you you need to decide what you think. Um, you know, personally, I think it's been nice to continue getting mail and and have a, a connection to the outside world. Um, but I would I would consider doing a follow up, even if you do that direct mail. You know, doing a, a one or two week follow up with an email that um, shows a slightly different side of that message and perhaps reaches out to people who um, aren't paying attention to their mail. Great. Thanks so much. Our next question is, do you think there's an appetite for virtual events such as happy hours with artists and donors? Sure. So I'll start and invite my colleagues to weigh in. I think yes, yes, and yes. I think, uh, you know, we understand that there are various union issues associated with uh, streaming content with artists. And, you know, each organization needs to navigate the complexities of that. But to the extent that you can easily uh, produce content and stream content featuring your artists at home, um, I've seen some really interesting uh, play readings uh, by surprise uh, guests around the city of Chicago, kind of in home, off the cuff. Un unrehearsed, if you will. Um, I've seen uh, one of my clients who's on the call right now and who I would say is a model for how to navigate through this has, has led um, post-show discussions. So they're streaming a, a play online right now and they've done a post-show discussion with the artistic director of the staff um, and that went really well. Uh, I, I think the short answer is yes. And you can look around your your field and find peers who are doing this really well to get some inspiration. 
I would I would really encourage you you all to consider how to do this with the caveat that you don't want it to be uh, incredibly time consuming and take you days and days and days and days to get it up and running. Uh, you want to be nimble and flexible, uh, which is hard for for many of us in this space who are uh, so buttoned up and we are you know in order to to put put uh, something on a stage or in an exhibition hall, we, we need uh, near perfection uh, for so many of us. And that's why we're so good at what we do. And this is a time to let go of some of that, which can be challenging, but I promise you it's uh, really rewarding for your viewers and can only help you build stronger relationships with, with potential donors. I would agree with that. And I would just add, you know, I, I got this question from a client the other day, you know, are, aren't people zoomed out? Um, and I just thought that was funny. I thought, you know, we don't know how much, how much more time we have um, living in this new world. I think it's a little early to say that, you know, it, there are too many Zoom requests. But I also think there's a big difference between, you know, the meetings that you go through in your work day and the social hours. Um, you know, I certainly feel like it's a different experience having um, calls with with colleagues as much as I might love them than it is, you know, hopping on a, a family happy hour for my dad's birthday, like I did a couple of days ago. When um, you know, it's it's all we have right now. That's our social interaction, and and it's our outlet and um, I, I think uh, it's a really fun space to be operating in right now because to Melissa's point, you get to be creative. Uh, you have some license to, to try new things and try weird backgrounds and, you know, collaborative playlists and anything else you can think of that, that makes it fun. And, and I'll jump in with just one more example. I've seen some really fun, creative um programs that are being put together and as Melissa was saying not polished really spontaneous where you're sharing something surprising about people that that you may know in a certain context so for example I've seen a couple of museums have their curators talk about something that you would never think about from that particular curator they're sharing you know they, they may be a, a person who studies dinosaurs and they're sharing their favorite wines um, and food pairings that go with it so they're they're entertaining and they're unique and they're different and they give you this this way to see some of these people in a very human context and to build connections with your your members and your stakeholders in ways that people never would have have expected there's been some really fun simple programming I think there's a huge appetite Great, thanks so much. Um, I'd next uh, like to share an audience member's story and related questions. As grant writers for arts and cultural nonprofits, we see all of our clients struggling to sustain their organizations while many of their revenue generating activities and programs are suspended indefinitely. We are asking many loyal funders to consider unrestricting funds previously awarded for programming. And we are all working to making our case based on what we think the funders will want to know. Most arts and cultural nonprofits need funding just to keep essential staff and be able to pay overhead in hopes they can sustain the organization through this period and resume programming in full glory as soon as possible. We are curious to know if you have any advice for what to say or not to say to funders and how much detail we should share about the precarious financial situations many of them face at this time. We fear that painting too dire a picture will make funders concerned about the long-term sustainability of the organization and therefore reluctant to contribute or release funding for general operating expenses. Kathy, I think you touched on some of this on, on one of your slides. So uh, why don't you run with it to, to start? Sure, sure, happy to. And that's a really, that's a really Good question, and I think that the advice that we would give you today is different from the advice we might have given you um, two months ago, and it might be different than the advice that we'll give you in the future. Right now, you do want to have a balance between, um, you don't want to be sharing too dire of information, but you want to be sharing authentic, realistic, transparent information with your funders. And if we take our lead from where um, things like the CARES Act, really focus and where and where that attention is is put 
it's to people and it's to retaining people. So if you are asking funders to shift from programs to maintaining your ability to keep your core staff, um, I think that that's the kind of ask you can make right now that is not one that you would have had the ability to make uh, prior. And it's one that I think that a lot of foundations are going to respond to because the, the real focus is what can we do to keep organizations together right now so that they can come out the other side and resume uh, fulfilling their mission. So I would encourage you not to be painting a, a drastic, horrible, desire, uh, uh, destructive picture, but one that's really focused on we're heads up, we know where we're at, we've done a lot of looking into all of the different options and resources. Here's specifically what we need from you right now during this time. I would just add that there's a heightened awareness right now of the importance that arts and culture plays in our lives, in our communities. Uh, I said earlier, we feel your absence. And I don't think that's just me as a an arts patron feeling that. I do think uh, the we feel that on a larger level in our communities. I know in Chicago, our mayor uh, and the governor of our state have made some pretty bold uh, statements relative to the importance of arts. I've heard other board members around the country, as you can imagine, I've participated in several board meetings, emergency board meetings over the last couple of weeks. And I've just heard that affirmation of the importance of arts and culture over and over again. So I do think there is an opportunity in a way to reclaim our importance and, and share that with our funding community, with our foundation partners, our corporate partners, our individual donors, our public leaders. Uh, we, we feel this absence right now. It's, it's striking and uncomfortable. And I think it's uh, something we can talk about and uh, leverage in a positive way when we're on the other side of this. Thank you. A follow-up question to that would be, should organizations prepare short-term or contingency operating budgets? So I think that uh, the answer for all planning right now is we need an A and a B plan. So I would advise, yes, uh, plan for that contingency. But keep your plans uh, that you may have had before this crisis on hand. This is where letting the board in perhaps a little closer might be helpful and helping them understand the business of what you do, which is something we spoke about earlier, can be helpful. This is a time to really co call on your leaders to help guide you through this and advise and bring their expertise to the table uh, and, and build their understanding of what you do and what it costs and how this decision might impact that decision. So I would say yes, plan for that contingency. Keep your, your current plan as well and bring your board in uh, very close to this process. Kelsey or Kathy, anything to add? I agree with that. I, I would just add, um, this is a, I'm going across sectors now, but I'll, I'll give you all an example um, of a communication I got actually just this morning um, from my alma mater, and I'm involved there as a volunteer, and um, my staff contact in the office forwarded uh, an email that went out to the staff about rebudgeting that has been done through June 30th, and um, it was very specific. I mean, it was it was high level, but it was Here's the impact we think this is going to have on us through June 30th. Here are the decisions that we are making based upon that. Here is what we're not saying. And that's not because, you know, everything's going to change on July 1st, but because we don't yet have the capability to look past this point. And, and I, I found that very reassuring. Um, and so I would just say, in addition to bringing your board into that process and involving them um, in, in the decision making, uh, think about how you can distill that message and share it with other audiences to boost their confidence that, that you're doing all of the right things. 
the other thing I'd like to add to what Melissa and Kelsey have shared is, is sort of two thoughts. One is I do think that we need to be planning for a longer period than just the next month or, or eight weeks. Um, I think we need to be thinking about how the impact of this crisis um, will be affecting our ability to go out and fulfill our mission over the next um, extended period of time. I'm seeing some uh, recommendations that you really think about what does the next 18 months look like, especially if you're in an organization that requires gathering of people to uh, be carrying out your mission. So, so how do you plan for a longer period of time? And to Melissa's point, that plan A and that plan B, you will be better off if you have a roadmap that you've thought through and you've talked about that extends um, longer and then you don't need that plan. So I think it's, it's important to be thinking about that. The other thing that it's important for you to be thinking about as an organization is there's been a lot of conversation in society in general around essential versus non-essential um, organizations, staff, um, and, and resources. That's a really challenging concept. And it's challenging because as a nonprofit, nobody in your organization is not essential. Um, we know that you do a lot with little resources and you wouldn't have a position, you wouldn't have an aspect of your mission that wasn't essential on some level. So back to what Melissa was saying earlier in terms of this hierarchy of need, internally, how do you communicate to your board? How do you communicate to your team members um, about this concept of essential and non-essential? I don't have solid answers for that, but I do know it's something that you need to be thinking through, especially um, in light of really hard decisions around furloughs and, and layoffs. So my recommendation is be thinking about the long term for your budgeting, um, be thinking about what you're going to do over the next few months and then what you're going to do over perhaps the next year um, and to be prepared. Great, thank you. Our next question is, I am trying to convince Capital Campaign Committee members that COVID-19 is an ideal time to try new funding avenues like virtual auctions. Any hints for how to respond to resistance? People seem tired and overstressed. I can hop in on this one. Um, I, you know, I think the best way to overcome resistance is to point to success stories. And, and um, to the extent that, you know, this webinar can help you if, if anybody has had success in leveraging their committees, um, we, we invite you to, you know, reach out to us and we'll share that with, with everybody else. Um, I, I think, you know, talking to some of your peer organizations and um, just paying attention to um, what, what those folks are doing and, you know, maybe picking up the phone and calling somebody to ask them about the process. Being able to share that and say, you know, look what, what these organizations were able to do. And, and I know a little bit about, you know, the steps that they took. Um, that's really helpful. The other thing I would say is, you know, it can be helpful to break it down. So um, sometimes, and, and I say this um, as a nonprofit volunteer as well, you know, my resistance to new things is always, do we have the right infrastructure and the right processes in place? Or is or am I going to have to figure out how to do this for the organization? So um, being able to come to them and say, we have a plan and we're going to produce a toolkit or just a folder of templates um, for outreach that you can use. And, and actually, it's a lot like what you would do for uh, an in-person event. Um, that type of information can really help soothe uh, the nerves of, of volunteers. I, I would just add to this that, uh, you know, you might not need your whole committee to get on board right now. Find one partner, find one champion. And maybe that person is not currently on the committee. Maybe he or she is on the board serving in other ways. Maybe he or she is a donor, uh, not currently involved as a volunteer. But find that one person who will join with you on this crusade that you're on and find that success together and you would be surprised how success breeds success and people want to will want to jump in to that winning team so maybe shift your uh, goal of finding full committee buy-in and think about finding that one person 
who can be your co-captain or co-champion of this effort. Great, thank you. Our next question is, are you seeing trends in corporate support? Is it similar to major donors or should we be concerned about losing our current corporate supporters to social service causes? Yeah, I think we as a sector are always worried about losing our corporate support. It never feels like it's on firm ground, uh, whether we're in a crisis or not. That being said, I think what I'm seeing, and I'll invite my colleagues to weigh in as well, I'm seeing that it's case by case there uh, as well. We have seen some really extraordinary acts of generosity within the corporate space, uh, mostly going toward basic human need or, or human service. We've seen some corporations uh, really uh, bleeding right now, and we just, we can't begin to talk to them no matter what sector we represent. So I think we know who they are, uh, and, and those seem to be close to all of us. And then somewhere in the middle are corporate partners I've seen who are saying, you know what, keep my sponsorship for the gala, I don't need a refund, or keep my sponsorship for that exhibition or play and do what you need to do with it, or, uh, you know, how can I help kind of, uh, um, a, a how can you help kind of spirit. So I do think that there is room uh, to raise money within the corporate sector right now. I think it's case by case. And I think you will have the best shot with those partners who've been with you for a really long time and who know you and who, whose employees engage with you and who, who just really uh, appreciate the value you bring on multiple levels. Kelsey, Kathy, anything to add? No, I think I think that covers it. Um, you, you know, there is a, a corporate tax um, giving incentive in the CARES Act, as I mentioned briefly too. So there might be uh, some organizations who have supported you who you know want to take advantage of that. Um, and and again, I think you know we just have to do our best to be in communication um, through our, our connections to um, those institutions and, and make sure that, you know, we're talking to them and, and sharing our news with them as much as any other organization is. So um, I would echo everything you said, Melissa. And I would just add one more thing. If, if you are canceling your spring gala or golf outing or whatever you do, and you typically raise sponsorship dollars uh, through that event, I would not assume that you shouldn't ask those corporate partners to support you. So in other words, take it case by case and where appropriate based on what you know of the company's health and culture, I would continue to ask those supporters to support you and say, you typically give through our gala or our golf outing or our insert event at this time. Can we count on you for your support, even though we've had to cancel the event or postpone the event. So definitely still ask unless you know there's a particular uh, circumstance within the company that pro prohibits you from doing this at this time. Thank you. Our next question is, we are looking at some of our fall events with slight concern. How early is too early to begin planning alternatives to in-person events? Or should we be planning alternatives as we look towards the usual event structure? Mm -hmm. Kelsey, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. I, I mean, I don't think it's too early. I think we we were chatting about this in, internally a, a little bit about how, you know, we started to get some questions from um, clients who typically do their events in the fall about, you know, whether that um, will even be a good idea. And I think, you know, we've, we've already seen some organizations who, who generally do their galas in the spring reschedule to the fall. So, you know, we're going to have, um, in some cases, a, a heavier event season than we have before. Um, I think we also have to look outside of the sector too. I mean, I, I have 
a couple of weddings that I was invited to this spring that have been, you know, rescheduled for the fall. And I think there, there will be overlapping priorities um, for many people. So um, again, I, I don't know that there's a, a right answer here. And, and I think it's a conversation that you need to have with your board and have with your um, event planning committees. But um, it, if you've been thinking about alternatives and want to explore what that might look like, I think this year is, is probably a, a good year to do it. And I'd be curious, uh, Melissa and Kathy, what, what you think. Yeah, I'll, I'll emphasize something that Melissa had said early on. Now is the time to really rethink the purpose and function of your events. You know, what do you accomplish through your events? Is it friend raising? Is it community building? Is it fundraising? And do your events, are your events the best tool to be doing that? Think about the ROI on events. Events historically have a really challenging ROI for the amount of time and resources that go into them versus what they accomplish, at least on the fundraising side, um, especially when you look at things compared to like major gifts um, and even, even annual fund uh, solicitations. So think about what are you trying to accomplish um, how do you accomplish that? And is there something other than an event that can accomplish the same, the same function or purpose? And then if you feel like that event is really essential to who you are as an organization, for this year, you do want to think about, um, virtual alternatives or, or other ways to do some of that same, um, fundraising or that same, uh, friend raising that you might be doing. Now's the time to, to rethink that because I suspect a lot of people will either be overwhelmed with all the things they're expected to attend in the fall or they won't feel like they want to be in big group settings at, at galas, for example, just yet. Um, so now's the time to stay nimble and be creative. I agree with what you're saying. You can ask yourself, if we did not do this event, what might we be able to do? It's a really freeing question. So I encourage your, you to ask yourself that and, and see what you cook up with your team, maybe in a brainstorming session, and then start to put some facts and figures and, and numbers behind it. And you might have a pretty compelling story to tell for a shift in, in your activity around events. Thank you. Our next question is, how transparent should you be with donors regarding staffing and cuts right now? In, in my opinion, and I'll invite my colleagues to weigh in as well, I think we have to be transparent in this time. I don't think it's the lead message in a broad-based communication. Uh, but I do think we need to let our community know how this is impacting us and the, and the cost, uh, human, emotional, financial. Uh, the more we let people in, the more we let them know how we need their help, the more they can be positioned to help us. So I would encourage our clients to be transparent. You, you know, we, we know you have to walk a fine line in that you don't want to uh, give the signal that you are not healthy or viable. Uh, so we appreciate that sensitivity. And yet I think that there is permission and understanding in all factors of, in all categories of life right now that we are making tough decisions. We are all changing the way we do things. It's hard. For in every category of life. So I think that there is permission and understanding and honesty and openness, transparency always wins with, with your donors. Kathy, what would you add? I think you touched on this before. I agree 100% with what you're saying, Melissa. I think truly for, for most of us, the most painful part of this of this unprecedented experience is the impact that's happening, having on the people around us. And, um, and for most of the organizations that we work with, there is some level of staff cut or, or furlough staff loss. Um, and you do, you do want to be transparent that this is a very real and very human impact on, on your organization. Um, I wouldn't be sharing specifically with, with who you cut, um, or who's been laid off. But the fact that 
that you have had to furlough staff is definitely, um, I think you have this unique opportunity to be more transparent than than you can in other times. And I think that, that you will be building stronger, more authentic relationships with your donors through that messaging. I agree with, with both of you. And I would just add that um, to the extent that it's possible, try to lay out the steps to, you know, making right what what is happening right now. So um, just a quick example, I'm a museum educator by, by trade. So it hit me really hard when I saw that MoMA had to um, end all of their contracts with educators um, earlier this week, I believe. And I think, you know, the message that I want to hear and, and know from them um, is, you know, what's the path back there? What are the what are the steps that the organization is taking to make sure that when it reopens, they can, you know, rehire and, and begin to, you know, support that really critical um, part of, of their family, their staff family that is um, bringing art to the lives of, of, you know, thousands of people probably on a daily basis. So um, try to tell the, the sort of next step story and, and bring your funders into that with you. Great, thank you so much for sending in your questions. Um, we'd love to use this as an opportunity to learn from one another. So if you do have any outreach samples that you'd like to share with the group, please send them to the email list on the slide. We'll be compiling the samples and we'll be sharing them with all webinar, webinar attendees after. And with that, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We also encourage you to visit our COVID-19 resource page where you can read our advice review resources and schedule a free consultation with us. Within 24 hours, you'll be receiving a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording and resource page. In the meantime, please don't hesitate to email our presenters with any questions you have. Thank you so much and take care.